Good afternoon. Hello, hello, and welcome. My name is Jeff Bowen, and I'm the Director of Library Programming in Public Affairs. On behalf of Pepperdine Libraries, I am so thrilled to welcome you to today's panel discussion, American Inheritance, Liberty, Slavery, and Religion in Revolutionary America. The Pepperdine Libraries are the academic heart of the educational environment, and we are so honored to spotlight research from our faculty colleagues. Uh, Dean Mark Rusa is traveling right now and is disappointed to have to miss this, but he was so delighted that today's rescheduled date worked for the entire panel. Uh, our sincere thanks go out to Dr. Lee Katz, Dr. Dana Dudley, and the rest of the Seaver Dean's office for this tag-teamed iteration of the W. David Baird Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm going to call Dr. Katz up to the podium in a moment, uh, but first I want to share a couple of our exciting upcoming programs. First, on Wednesday, March 6th, from 7 to 8 p.m., the library's Rushford Center for the Research on the Churches of Christ is pleased to welcome Dr. Nijay K. Gupta for the annual Frank Pack Distinguished Christian Scholar Lecture in Stauffer Chapel. Dr. Gupta, excuse me, Dr. Gupta will speak on his new book, Tell Her Story, How Women Led, Taught, and Ministered in the Early Church. Then on Thursday, March 14th, 10 to 11 a.m., we're thrilled to present Professor Ron Highfield in conversation with Pepperdine alumnus Daniel Spencer here in the surfboard room. Dr. Spencer is a minister in the Church of Scotland whose new book, Forsaking the Fall, Original Sin and the Possibility of a Non-Lapsarian Christianity will be the topic of the conversation, along with discussing what it's like to pursue an academic career in religion. Uh, you can find these events and more at library pepperdine.edu. Uh, and now I'd like to invite Dr. Lee Katz, Interim Dean of Seaver College, to the podium. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, welcome to the final W. David Baird lecture of this school year. We're excited that you are here. I want to say just a couple words about W. David Baird. Uh, Professor Baird was a historian here on our faculty here. He was dean of Seaver College for 10 years. And a special place in my heart, he first invited me into academic leadership 23 years ago to be part of his team when he was in the dean's office. He was a distinguished scholar, and this was his brainchild. This was his idea that he launched in 2002 um, to pro provide an opportunity for students, faculty, and staff to interact with thought leaders, policymakers, authors from, from around the world. And it is one of our most prestigious lecture series here on campus, so welcome. It gives me great uh, honor to introduce a friend, a colleague, and a neighbor who is the, the kind of the keynote of, of our evening tonight. Uh, my pleasure to introduce Professor Ed Larson. Professor Larson first came to Pepperdine in 2006 as the Hugh and Hazel Darling Chair in Law and as the University Professor of History. Prior to his appointment on our campus, Ed was a renowned scholar, historian, dedicated attorney, educator, and before coming to Malibu, he had already a very established reputation as a scholar and author in American history. He is the author of 22 books and the recipient of the 1998 Pulitzer Prize. Dr. Larson is one of the most accomplished scholars at Pepperdine University. Internally, he has been awarded the Caruso School of Law's Dean's Excellence Award in Scholarship, and just this past year, 2023, Ed earned the Stephen D. Davis Award for Scholarly Achievement, and I want to acknowledge Dr. Davis, who that uh, award is named after. Dr. Davis. <laughs> this afternoon, we are privileged to have the chance to discuss Dr. Larson's latest book, American Inheritance, Liberty and Slavery in the Birth of a Nation. Professor Larson and a panel of scholars are here and they will be introduced by Assistant Dean of Seaver College, Dana Dudley. I'm honored to introduce our panelists tonight. First, we have Dr. Richard Hughes, scholar in residence at Lipscomb University and Professor Emeritus at both Pepperdine University and Messiah College. He was a member of the faculty at Pepperdine for over 20 years, so many of you know him. 
His scholarly interests include religion and race in America, religion and American self-understanding, religion and American higher education, and the history of the restorationist traditions in the United States, especially among the histories of the Churches of Christ. He has authored, co-authored, or edited 17 books, including Myths America Lives By, White Supremacy and the Stories That Give Us Meaning, a favorite of my students, and his most recent book, The Grace of Troublesome Questions, Vocation, Restoration, and Race. Dr. Christina Littlefield, Associate Professor with a dual appointment in Communication and Religion. She has a PhD in Divinity from the University of Cambridge, and her Master of Arts and her Bachelor's degree are both from Pepperdine University. She has authored or co-authored two books, as well as several book chapters and articles. She co-authored a book with Dr. Hughes entitled Christian America and the Kingdom of God, White Christian Nationalism from the Puritans through January 6, 2021, and that is forthcoming this year. Dr. Chris Soper, Distinguished Professor of Political Science, he earned his PhD, MA, and MDiv from Yale. He did his BA at the University of Washington. He specializes in U.S. politics, comparative politics, and religion and politics. He has authored and co-authored several books and articles, including his most recent book, Religion and Nationalism in Global Perspective, with Dr. Joel Fetzer, published by Cambridge. This evening's format, we will first hear from Dr. Hughes, then Dr. Littlefield, then Dr. Soper, and a response by Dr. Larson. Then we'll open it up to a Q&A to all of you here, and that will be followed by a book signing. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here, to be back at our campus. Can I ask you to do this? Sure. Can I ask? No. Can you hear me? We'll just do it from up here. Now you can hear me. In his book, American Inheritance, Professor Larson has embraced a simple yet incredibly revealing way to eliminate the entrenched power of slavery in the years of this nation's founding. He simply took two words, liberty and slavery, and examined how so many well-heeled and privileged white Americans from 1765 to 1795 routinely employed those words to portray themselves as victims who stood on the brink of enslavement and sometimes as actual slaves, even as they winked at the very real enslavement of millions of Africans, an enslavement in which they themselves routinely and willingly participated, not as slaves, but as masters. Professor Larson's book has been a great gift for me since it's helped me grasp in ways I had not grasped before two great truths about our nation's founding. The first of those truths is the incredible depth and astounding breadth of the commitment to slavery on the part, on the part of the founding generation. The second of those truths is the extent to which the founders baked racism into the American experiment precisely through their disingenuous use of language. And I want to frame my remarks around those two truths. Many of the founders and many, of other, many other privileged whites of that generation openly proclaim their unyielding commitment to slavery for blacks, even as they claimed an unyielding commitment to liberty for themselves. Providence never designed us for Negroes, John Adams wrote in 1765, and never intended us for slaves. Boston educator James Lovell wrote that we are slaves until we obtain redress through the justice of our king. And American patriots urged resistance to taxes imposed by parliament lest they, and here Larson quotes the patriots own language, lest they become Negroes. John Dickinson offers a final example. Dickinson, who kept more blacks in bondage than anyone else in the Pennsylvania region where he lived, nonetheless worried that if taxed without their consent, the Americans would become Britain's slaves. Indeed, he asked without the slightest trace of irony, is it possible to form an idea of slavery more complete, more miserable, more disgraceful than that of a people where justice is administered, government exercised, and a standing army maintained at the expense of the people, and yet without the least dependence on them? 
No irony whatsoever. That sort of willful blindness to the irony of their lives could only have been sustained by their deep-seated conviction that blacks were somehow and truly less than whites and perhaps, perhaps even less than human. The New England preacher Samuel Hopkins admitted as much when he confessed that many whites had viewed blacks as, quote, quite another species of animals. Indeed, Jefferson, who penned the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that same Thomas Jefferson flatly claimed in his notes on the state of Virginia that, quote, the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstance, are inferior to whites, so committed to black inferiority were the leading voices of the American founding that they typically dismiss black genius, the sort of genius found in, say, a Phyllis Wheatley or a Benjamin Boniker, as no genius at all. The only term that seems to fully capture the attitudes the American patriots held toward themselves, toward blacks, toward liberty, on the one hand and slavery on the other, is the term white supremacy. The perverse juxtaposition of liberty and slavery so forthrightly put into words by so many American patriots of the founding generation has become over the years a staple in American life. A staple often assumed but seldom articulated with any precision. Indeed, that perverse juxtaposition of liberty and slavery was baked into the American experiment, baked into our religious understandings, baked into the patterns of our neighborhoods, baked into our legal documents, and baked into what we often call the American dream. Over the years, the formula has shifted from liberty and slavery to liberty and oppression into liberty and the denial that the descendants of people once enslaved have any history worth telling, any story that should be told. The extent to which the liberty-slavery juxtaposition transformed American religion can be seen in the contours of American evangelicalism in our own time and place. In the first half of the 19th century, northern evangelicals took seriously Jesus' own announcement of his prophetic vocation. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said, because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. Armed with that vision, northern evangelicals in the early 19th century led the fight to abolish slavery, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to let the oppressed go free. To the thousands of southern evangelicals who held black people in bondage found it impossible to embrace the institution of slavery and Jesus' vision at one and the same time. And so they transformed the Christian religion into a private faith, a matter of the heart, with virtually no social implications. They, they transformed Jesus' concern for people who suffer in the here and now into another worldly religion, chiefly concerned with a heavenly reward in the life to come. In that way, they could claim liberty for themselves while enslaving and brutalizing other human beings, and they could do so with, with con consciences relatively free of guilt. To the extent that Christianity continues to thrive in the United States, it is often that sort of privatized, otherworldly religion that has become relatively common in American life today. The extent to which some variant of the liberty-slavery juxtaposition was baked into our laws and patterns of our neighborhoods has been documented at length by Richard Rothstein in his book, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. If you've not read this book, it's a great one. There he argues this simple thesis, and I'm quoting Rothstein. Racial segregation in housing was not the result of a single law that co-signed African Americans to designated neighborhoods Rather, scores of racially explicit laws, regulations, and government practices combined to create a nationwide system of urban ghettos surrounded by white suburbs. Without our government's purposeful imposition of racial segregation, the other causes, private prejudice, white flight, real estate steering, bank redlining, income differences, and self-segregation all would have existed, but with far less opportunity for expression. Segregated by intentional government action is not de facto, rather it is what courts call de jure, segregation by law and public policy. 
the extent to which the perverse just justification of liberty and slavery is to find the American dream can be seen in two recent and common complaints that any attempt to pass common sense gun laws, for example, or any attempt to enforce the wearing of masks in the midst of a deadly epidemic were grave infringements on the liberties guaranteed Americans. And the extent to which that perverse understanding of the American dream was rooted in race can be heard in the all too common black lament eloquently summarized by ta Coates. In the letter Coates wrote to his son entitled Bet Between the World and Me. I've seen this dream all my life, Coates wrote. It is Memorial Day cookouts, block associations, and driveways. The dream is tree houses and the Cub Scouts. The dream smells like peppermint that tastes like strawberry shortcake. And for so long, I've wanted to escape into that dream to, to fold my country over my head like a blanket. But this has never been an option because the dream rests on our backs, the bedding made from our bodies. But most of all, the liberty slavery juxtaposition has defined the two most dominant of all the American myths, the myth of white supremacy and the myth of American innocence. The way so many white American patriots of the founding generation juxtapose slavery and liberty, liberty for themselves, but slavery for human beings of African descent, was nothing if not a full-throated proclamation of white supremacy. But it was also a declaration of white American innocence, reflected in their moral blindness. Larson tells, for example, how the Massachusetts delegates to the First Continental Congress, quote, rode to Philadelphia in a carriage drawn by four horses, Trailing them in servant's livery, two black attendants rode on horseback and two walked. John Adams wrote at the time, wrote at the time with obvious delight, we are universally acknowledged the saviors and defenders of American liberty. They could imagine themselves the innocent defenders of liberty because they believed themselves entitled to freedom in ways that they believed blacks were not. As James Otis noted in what Larson calls the best known and most often reprinted pamphlet in response to Parliament's Sugar Act of 1764, quote, every British subject born of the continent of America or in any other of the British dominions is entitled to all the natural, essential, inherent, and inseparable rights of our fellow subjects in Great Britain. They could imagine themselves the innocent defenders of liberty because of their privileged status as Christians citizens of the imperial kingdom of God enshrined in Europe from the time of Constantine the Great. And they could imagine themselves the innocent defenders of liberty because they firmly believed that this new nation they were creating was rooted in the eternal laws of nature, those laws that defined the way that things were meant to be. Finally, Larson's unveiling of the patriots' deep commitment to freedom for themselves and slavery for blacks, sustained in part by the abuse of language, has taken me back to a book that has shaped my thinking for many, many years. The Broken Covenant, written by one of my teachers and mentors, Robert Bella. Bella argued there that once in each of the last three centuries, America has faced a time of trial, the time of testing so severe that not only the form, but even the existence of our nation have been called into question. Bella identified the first of those times of trial as the American Revolution of the 18th century with its struggle for liberty. Tellingly, however, Bella never mentioned the role of race in that revolutionary struggle. And he never mentioned the moral ambiguities that surrounded the term liberty during the nation's founding years. Bella clearly recognized the role of race and racism in the nation's second time of trial, the Civil War, and the nation's third time of trial, the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s. Indeed, he wrote of the Cultural Revolution of the 60s that, quote, the struggle of oppressed racial groups to improve their position in America is a major aspect of our third time of trial. But by failing to recognize what Larson sees so clearly, namely the perverse juxtaposition of liberty and slavery in the nation's founding years, and as a result, the way in which racism is to find the American nation from its time of origin, Bella implicitly divorced the racial dimensions of the second and third times of trial from the root of both, the racist dimensions of the American founding. 
Larson, however, has helped me to see that the issue of race inescapably stands at the center of this nation's times of trial, all three of them. Indeed, the issue of race stands at the center of our fourth time of trial, which it seems to me is rapidly engulfing the nation today, and that links us, whether we know it or not, to the perverse and ambiguous use of two small words, liberty and slavery, at the time of this nation's founding. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to Professor Larson and Dr. Dudley for inviting me to be on this panel and to Jeffrey Bowen and Leslie Sia for their organizing prowess. I am deeply honored to be on a panel with such illustrious scholars. Um, American inheritance, liberty, and slavery in the birth of a nation is full of delicious historical tidbits that illustrate the tensions and paradoxes inherent in the nation's founding, as, and as Dr. Hughes just described, inherent today. Larson begins his book by noting today's contemporary battles over how to interpret the nation's founding period, including those on the right who want to focus on liberty, and those on the left who want us to more fully reckon with the long imprint of slavery. What Larson then brilliantly does with extensive use of primary source resources is lead the reader through how those debates unfolded in real time between 1765 and 1795. He utilizes voices across the spectrum. He cites white voices and black voices, men and women, abolitionists, pragmatists, enslavers, federalists and anti-federalists, and it contrasts those who recognize the inherent hypocrisy of demanding liberty from Britain while holding humans in bondage with those who seemed oblivious to this tension. Several vignettes illustrate some of these core tensions, and so I want to share the ones that really stood out to me. So pre-revolution, Larson illustrates how American patriots stress their status as free men and their demands for liberty. As British citizens, they avowed, singing a national hymn, to never be slaves. And they argued that taxation without representation was a form of slavery, even as they knew or personally perpetuated the most brutal form of human enslavement ever known in human history. For example, Larson quotes John Adams as declaring during the Stamp Act crisis of 1765 that, quote, we will not be their Negroes. Whether Adams ever admitted the irony in this, Larson doesn't tell us, but he provides clear evidence that his wife, Abigail, pointed it out to him. For she wrote in September 1774 that she wished there was not a single slave in the province. It always appeared a more iniquitous scheme to me. Fight ourselves for what we are daily robbing and plundering from those who have as good a right to freedom as we have. While Larson documents the John Adams stance as the dominant one in the colonies, he also shows Abigail's supporters, from her friend Mercy Otis Warren, Baptist minister John Allen, Congregationalist Samuel Hopkins, and Dr. Benjamin Rush. Wherever there have been racists, there have been those fighting back for fuller humanity. Larson shows how knowledge of chattel slavery may have made the slavery rhetoric even more emotionally powerful for Americans in town on their freedom, leading even opponents of slavery, like Thomas Paine and Common Sense, to use the metaphor to incite people to fight for their freedom. Paine further inflamed his readers by denouncing England for offering to free the enslaved to help suppress the revolution. Larson notes that Paine, who was raised by Quaker abolitionist family, was careful to not condemn American slavery. For Paine may have hated American slavery, but he hated the British monarch more. Such pragmatic calculations are common throughout this period. Indeed, Larson's best examples illustrate the inherent tensions of liberty and slavery within individual lives. Take, for example, his treatment of black poet Phyllis Wheatley. She became renowned for her poetry in the U.S. and England, challenging racial stereotypes about black intelligence. She was the first African-American woman and only third female American period to publish a book. Her friends in England, though, had to pressure the family to free her. And then she stayed with them her whole life. 
Motivated in part by her conversion to Christian faith, Wheatley spoke in favor of the revolution and the liberties of all Americans, while also calling for the same freedoms to be granted to the enslaved. She wrote to the abolitionist minister Samson Occam, In every human breast, God has implanted a principle, which we call love of freedom. It is impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance. And by the leave of our modern Egyptians, I will assert that the same principle lives in us. Though he was known for enslaving people and vigorously chasing his runaways, Wheatley sent a a poem to George Washington on the battlefield, extolling the freedom of the land and his personal valor and virtues. Larson also notes how both the British and the Americans wrestled with what role black people could play in the revolution. Both sides treated free black people and the enslaved as inferior and relegated them to the mostly non-combatant domestic servant role. Both sides often acted more pragmatically than in principle. But here, as I was first listening to the audible version of the book in late September, I remember turning on my street and realizing that Larson had me out and out rooting for the British particularly British General Carleton, who thwarted George Washington in working to evacuate as many of the enslaved as he could out of New York City, so Nova Scotia and other British territories, because he was intent on keeping the promises that had been made to them that they would be freed if they took the British side. Um, Larson then carefully traced the, the fates of many of Washington's own runaways in this particular story. George Washington at first tried to banish free black people from military service after some had nobly fought at Bunker Hill, but he later reneged when necessity required their service, and some 5,000 ultimately served on the American side, to 15,000 on the British side. While most of the British still ended up enslaved, um, others did earn their freedom. Now, I know my colleague, Dr. Sober, is going to speak more to the constitutional battles here, but I want to note the pragmatic calculus at work. Throughout the book, Larson illustrates the evolution of Benjamin Franklin from his fear of non-Anglo-Saxon immigrants and his acceptance of human enslavement to eventually working to end human enslavement in Pennsylvania. But when it came to establishing the nation and writing the Constitution, it was more important to Franklin that we have a strong central government than it was that we curtailed human enslavement. And ultimately, the priorities, or perhaps the prejudices of those in the North, allowed them to fold their principled objections to slavery under sustained Southern pressures. What Larson shows more than anyone I've seen is how that Southerners fought harder to extend slavery than Northerners did to curtail it. One more exceptional vignette to synthesize the inherent tensions between liberty and slavery here. Larson details how freedom and liberty were all part of Washington's tour as he moved toward the Capitol uh, to give his inaugural address, and how that address then touted the, the country's arduous struggles for liberties and spoke of a reverence for the character, characteristic rights of free men. But then he also shares the journey of one Ona Judge, an enslaved household servant of Martha Washington who served as her main attendant. Judge's mother was an enslaved seamstress who was part of Martha's dowry. Her father was an indentured servant who left when the terms of his service were up. The Washingtons brought Judge from Virginia to New York City, where many wealthy families still held enslaved household servants, but where she could also mix with free black people as she ran errands around town. They then moved with the capital to Philadelphia, where the elite of society had almost uniformly um, embraced abolition. By 1783, Rush, an early opponent of enslavement and its contradictions with Anglo-American principles of liberty, could write that any Philadelphian endorsing slavery is listened to with horror and is company avoided by everybody. Larson then details, name by powerful name, how almost no one else on the fashionable Market Street where Washington and Jefferson lived held humans in bondage. Now, I may have read too many Jane Austen novels, but I can just imagine the tension of these society uh, dinners. So in Philadelphia, Judge not only met more free black people, but also domestic servants in ground house, grand houses who were paid for their labor and relatively free in their mobility. Soon the Washington family learned that Pennsylvania's gradual abolition legislation meant that no one could bring enslaved persons into the state for more than six months or they would be declared free. 
So they de uh, decided a scheme to rotate their enslaved servants either home to Virginia or out of state for even one day to avoid this law. And despite this lame subterfuge, Judge and the other enslaved persons discerned the reasons for these rotations. But they acquiesced, even after Judge's brother drowned on one such rotation. But when Washington announced he wouldn't seek another term, and Martha indicated she planned to give Judge to a relative where her treatment would be even more in doubt, she used her contacts in the city to escape one night in uh, 1796 in May. Washington eventually located her and tried multiple times to get her back, and she even had to hide at one point to escape capture. Um, but ultimately, she remained free. She married, she had three children, and she outlived them all. She became a devout Christian, but increasingly impoverished. And so Larson records her telling a final interviewer that she had no regret for choosing liberty over slavery. No, I am free, and have I trust, been made a child of God by the means. Well, as Dana pointed out, uh, my work in political science focuses on politics and religion. You can imagine that gets heated at times. But my topic is downright placid compared to the topic of Ed's book on the founding and slavery, which is an absolute battlefield. Since at least the publication of the 1916 project by the New York Times in 2016, historians, politicians, and even local school boards have become enmeshed in a deeply polarized debate on what is the American origin story and how is it best to teach it. The divide pits those who see American ideals, natural rights, liberty, representative government as central to the founding against those who place slavery and racial oppression at the heart of both the revolution and of the Constitution. In a debate that often generates more heat than light, Ed's book provides a helpful corrective that places both liberty and slavery as the shared inheritance of the American founding. Ed convincingly demonstrates that colonists in the North and South made liberty the unifying principle of the revolution. Liberty was a natural right. The absence of liberty justified a revolution. For all their disagreements, the Federalists who favored ratification of the Constitution and the Anti-Federalists who opposed it supported the idea that their positions best promoted liberty. It was, as the television commercial might say, liberty, 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 all the time. And apparently, without fully realizing the irony and hypocrisy of their claims, the revolutionaries likened their own situation to that of slavery because of the bondage they suffered under British rule. The Stamp Act was a form of enslavement. Americans would never, ever be the slaves of their British overlords. But what did all this talk of liberty mean for the many blacks who were not free? And how could the framers reconcile the promise of liberty for some Americans with the reality of the enslavement of nearly one quarter of the country's population? Politicians criticizing the 1619 Project believe that the work is dangerous to the nation and that it misrepresents US history. Bills have been introduced banning the teaching of the project in public schools. The preamble to the federal bill, the Saving American History Act, asserts that the project, quote, denies the true principles on which the nation was founded. If Ed is right, however, slavery was one of the principles on which the nation was founded. As he nicely puts it, liberty to some meant the freedom of all people. To others, it meant freedom to own black people. The rise of liberty in this country can be fully understood only alongside the rise of slavery. Support for slavery was not simply a deviation from the founding principles of the United States, though it surely was that. Instead, slavery was justified as a positive good to many, and the practice of slavery became central to the economies of both North and South. 
One answer to the tension between a nation committed to liberty which allowed slavery was to manufacture an ideology to justify the apparent contradiction. As Ed notes, supporters of slavery, including Jefferson, began relying on supposedly scientific argument about racial differences to defend slavery. In doing so, they undermined traditional biblical beliefs about common human descent, and they planted the seeds for new racial identities, a tragic legacy that continues to bedevil our country more than two centuries later. Perhaps ironically, powerful ideologies about racial differences were particularly crucial in a country so deeply committed to human liberty. Once devoted to the idea of liberty, you had to have good reasons for limiting it. And theories of racial difference and racism fit the bill. Perhaps those theories became particularly pronounced in the United States precisely because of our commitment to liberty as a way to justify its denial to certain groups of people. A related critique of the 1619 Project is that it is guilty of presentism, or that it interprets past events in terms of modern values and concepts. And there is something to the argument that 21st century standards on gender, race, and sexual orientation cannot easily be applied to an 18th century world. But Ed undermines this claim, at least insofar as it relates to the issue of slavery, by noting that there were scores of people at the time who pointed out the framers' inconsistencies. No less a leading light than Samuel Johnson criticized the colonists' hypocritical views for upholding the idea of liberty while holding slaves. The slaves should be free, he sarcastically noted, an act which surely the lovers of liberty cannot but recommend. God bless those colonial Quakers, few in number, sadly, who by the middle decades of the 18th century condemned slavery as both ethically and religiously wrong in all circumstances. And of course, we have the voices of blacks themselves, like Prince Hall, Lemuel Haynes, Prince Whipple, and many others who saw what many of the framers refused to see that the blessings of liberty belong to blacks and whites alike. It is, in short, perfectly acceptable to judge the framers for failing, up, for failing to live up to their own standards. To argue that slavery is an inheritance of the founding, however, is not the same thing as saying that slavery is their only legacy. The American founding was also a world-changing event with liberty and political equality at the heart of that transformation. Throughout his book, Ed underscores just how central the idea of liberty was to the founding generations, and it was even central to slavery apologists like Madison and Jefferson. Madison, for example, became an important figure in the democratization of American politics as the founder with Jefferson of the Democratic Republican Party, that party's commitment to political equality was such that by 1824, all but three states had removed property-owning requirements for voting, at least for white men, thereby quadrupling the size of the electorate. Blanket condemnations of the American founding for failing its ideals failed to do justice to the degree to which the founders' commitment to liberty, liberty was genuine, albeit truncated. One reading of American history is that the framers' conviction that personal liberty was a fundamental natural right meant that it was almost inevitable that liberty would eventually be extended to those to whom it was initially denied, including blacks, women, indigenous populations, and gay and lesbian Americans. It's also valid to note that compromise and accommodation were part of the politics of the founding. The tension between liberty and slavery took on particular meaning with the drafting of the Constitution, where rhetorical commitments, whatever they might have been, had to be concretely expressed in a document to govern a new nation. The resulting Constitution was, was as Ed notes, a, quote, pragmatic mix of lofty ideals and lowly compromise. The word slave never appears in the Constitution itself, 
and slaves were referred to not as property, which Southern delegates had advocated for, but rather as persons, which subtly undermined slavery's legitimacy and infused the Constitution with anti-slavery undertones. Yet various provisions supported by slaveholders enshrined the institution of slavery in the Constitution. The infamous three-fifths clause increased the political power of slaveholding states in the House and in presidential selection. Toleration of the Atlantic slave trade until 1808 allowed an additional 200,000 enslaved Africans to be brought to the United States. And the fugitive slave clause, as Ed notes, came as close as anything in the Constitution to san sanctioning slavery at the federal level. The framers were practical men eager to achieve a stronger national government. And as practical men, they made compromises, particularly on the issue of slavery. For better and for worse, that is often how politics works. Ed concludes the book by noting that liberty and slavery remain our conflicted American inheritance. The story so effectively told by Ed in his book is that our founding is not one thing and one thing only. At times, contemporary attitudes toward the founding are a kind of latter-day Pelagianism, i.e. the heresy about human perfectionism. Progressives sometimes are guilty of faulting the founders for failing to be perfect, while conservatives are equally culpable for imagining that the founders were perfect. The founders were neither saints nor sinners, but both, a theological truism that is often overlooked in our heated debate. That is a more complicated national story to tell about ourselves and to our children. Perhaps it is even a less satisfying story. But unless we want to inculcate an unthinking national mythology about our past, it is essential that we offer a more com complete understanding of both liberty and slavery in our past. And Ed's book is a very good place to start. What can I say? First, to thank these people. It's an incredible privilege for a writer to hear what, how I'm read by wise and informed readers. It's an amazing privilege, and I've heard that today. I do want to begin, though, by thanking Lee, who as um, before his current post as uh, uh, Vice Provost for Research, um, instigated this event, but also in that role and in his current role, has done as much or more than anyone I know to advance research on this campus. So I want to thank you for that. In, in that, he follows the legacy of David Baird, who was the person who brought me here from the University of Georgia. And his enthusiasm and his encouraging, along with that of Dean Starr at the law school, was, and his, his vision for this place is what helped bring me here. I also want to thank the missing director of libraries, Mark, Jeff, and their team for making this all work. But back to what I said at the first. It's so rewarding to hear how one is read. Because as a historian, my goal is to simply trace down as best as I can without bias what happened. Present it out, and then to see how people who are informed and knowledgeable in their own ways read it and learn from it. I started the research on this project before the project you, several of you have mentioned, the uh, 1619 project. It was before that, but it was after some of the events started happening that prompted interest in the issue, but before that came out. 
and before the heated response to that. And that back and forth politicized it. So I naively walked into this before I knew it was going to become a political a field of minds for someone walking into that situation. But what, I, what my goal was throughout was to find out, as this issue was what, there were one side arguing based on a history of radical and progressive history that might include people like Howard Zim and others, that American history and the American Revolution was all about slavery. And there was the other side coming back, also based on a long tradition, that American Revolution, the Revolutionary was all about liberty. And I was curious. I just wanted to go back to the sources. And what I tried to do was go back always, never to read secondary sources, but to read primary sources, to see what people wrote, what people said, what people did at the time and presented. I didn't know how it would be received, but on the day, publication day, it turned out that both the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times chose to make it their premier book. Book of, you know, notable book, a book listed, and they both had full page reviews, both written by Pulitzer Prize winning and Lincoln Prize winning historian, John Meacham in one and Harold Holzer in the other, the premier historian of Lincoln. One on the left somewhat and one on the right, both, you know, not radicals, but both on both sides. And they both praised the book. Indeed, the last line of, in the Wall Street Journal was, well, now we know what happened. We have to decide what we do about it. And I think that was my point. I wasn't trying to write a polemic. I was trying to unpack what was said. And beyond all the points that have been brought out, I would just say that my main take-home message was that neither extreme was right. It was, as you've all said, it's a very complex, we have a complex inheritance. And that the revolution, revolutionary, was all about liberty. That whether it be a slaveholder like Washington or a person who became an abolitionist like Benjamin Franklin, they were all about liberty. They were sincerely fighting for liberty as they saw it. It wasn't about enslaving others. It was about liberty. But it was also about slavery because it was perpetuated. Now, it was a split decision in the sense that during the American Revolution, and this was true for whites and blacks, free and enslaved, free blacks and enslaved blacks as well. In the North, in the middle of the war, before the war, every single colony had legally sanctioned chattel slavery, a type of slavery, as Christine noted, different than any sort of slavery. It started in Barbados, really, not in, a, in the English colony of Barbados, but it has spread throughout the American colonies. Chattel slavery. People held like they would hold an animal with all the rights and privileges of that. And every colony had it, including northern colonies like New York, where maybe 20% of the people were enslaved, not just the South. But during the Revolutionary War, inspired by those ideas of liberty, the North, during the war, during the battles, Massachusetts ended slavery, abolished slavery. Pennsylvania abolished slavery. New Hampshire abolished slavery, Vermont abolished slavery, and Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York were on the way to abolishing slavery, inspired by these notions of liberty. While in the South, they doubled down on slavery. And in the North, as a result, in the North, as these documents show, and I had to go over a lot of primary documents to find this, in the North, free and enslaved blacks joined the American, joined the Patriot armies and militias 
to fight for liberty. And they all gained their liberty. Religious groups joined this. Evangelical groups, as you notice, fought for this. The Hopkinson religion is disinterested love. And no more important sign of disinterested love is if you liberate an enslaved person, because you can get nothing back from them. That is a sign that you are truly a Christian. In the South, though, where they were doubling down on slavery, the Africans fled to the British side. Because the British side, if they would leave their patriot masters, they would be free. And by the thousands, they fled for their liberty. But there, it was to the British, who, as you say, honored their commitment and took them off to Nova Scotia or back to England or recolonized them in uh, Sierra Leone. So it was about liberty, but it was also about slavery. And as um, Chris has pointed out, when they had to deal with that result, when they got to the Constitutional Convention and the Southern delegates realized how committed the Northerners were to the ending of slavery and how much they had come to abhor slavery. And the Northern delegates realized how committed the Southern delegates were to perpetuating slavery. They had to compromise and work out something because they wanted to have a national union with as opposed to the confederation that was just a league of friendship before. And so I'm often asked the question, and I'll say this is closing, I'm often asked the question, okay, after you've done all this, we're often asked, is the, is the Constitution a pro-slavery document or is it an anti-slavery document? I was asked that when the National Constitution Center had me for their main event last year. And I said, you're asking the wrong question. It's neither. The northern states would have never ratified the Constitution if, if they thought it was pro-slavery. They wouldn't have. And indeed, in the north, all the anti-federalists attacked the Constitution for being too pro-slavery. In contrast, the south would have never ratified the Constitution if they thought it was anti-slavery. And in the south, all the anti-federalists attacked the Constitution as true as to anti-slavery. And so it worked that compromise in between the two. Instead, what the compromises, with all the compromises that Chris has noted, what they ended up doing was write a document that protected state-sanctioned slavery in states that wanted to have it. And also created a document where states could abolish slavery. And amazingly, midway through this battle, midway through the Constitutional Convention, they adjourn for two weeks for the strangest reason of all. The northern states have become anti-slavery. The southern states have become pro-slavery. They both knew America's future, what makes Americans different, is the frontier. Without the frontier, Franklin and Washington agreed on that. What made America is that we had the frontier. We could always go west and be free, have opportunity, develop. We're not going to be trapped like they are in England. But they needed the west to be either free soil or slavery soil. And so, because so many members of the Decl at the Constitutional Convention were members of Con uh, the uh, Confederation of Congress, so many of them were, and the Confederation of Congress had not had a quorum for four years because it was so powerless that nobody went to it, or not enough. They left Philadelphia, adjourned, went up for three weeks, and passed the only piece of legislation that the Continental Congress ever passed of any significance, the Confederation Congress. And that was the Northwest Ordinance that barred slavery in the Northwest Territories. 
So there'd be a route free for free soil could continue to spread. And in the South, slavery could continue to spread throughout the Southwest, what became Alabama and Mississippi and those states. And so they work the compromise. The three-fifths compromise makes the same number of, the best they could figure, the same number of representatives from slave, from slave states and from free states. Giving each two senators, they know there's going to be an equal number because they know there's the current 13, but they know Vermont, Kentucky, and Tennessee are coming in right away as soon as they get a country. And so it's going to be eight and eight. And they know the Electoral College will do the same thing, but they know they have to have a route west. So they broke from the Constitution Convention, adopted the only bill that ever mattered, the, the, the Northwest Ordinance, and they went back, and then and only then could they settle the Constitution. So slavery was the heart of so much of what was happening. It an, was an incredible venture to go through this, a voyage for me to study these things and pulling them together. And I am so appreciative to Pepperdine and to Dean Katz now uh, and to the law school for giving me the opportunity and time to work with people like these in a Christian environment doing this sort of research. So thank you very much. As Dr. Davis said before the event, um, Professor Baird, Dr. Baird would be really proud of this event tonight. And uh, thank you so much. That was outstanding. Um, President Gash, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Provost Brewster, thank you for taking time to be here. And um, we have some time now, a few minutes, for questions and answer, answers. And uh, let me also say thanks to Dr. Lucy Larson. Ed, Ed's wife. Uh, she's our campus physician. Lucy, thank you for being here as well tonight. Uh, hello, I'm, uh, I have a question about um, some details. Uh, the Somerset de uh, decision and the uh, Lord Dunmore's proclamation. Um, there was fear before the Somerset decision and the uh, Dunmore's proclamation that it would have kind of these massive emancipatory um, results, and that, that didn't seem to materialize. Um, I was curious why, uh, why, why that didn't happen, why it didn't have a, a larger effect. It's assumed by General Clinton, who was in charge of the army, all the British Army for the entire colonies by his Plattsburgh resolution, which did the same thing. And that had an enormous impact. African Americans flooded, including dozens from Washington's plantation, scores from Jefferson's plantation, all of the enslaved people from um, um, uh, the chief, um, the president of the, before Hamilton, uh, Hancock, the one before him, from um, uh, South Carolina. They, so it did have an impact. Um, what it, and it was used to rally the South to the depravity of the, the British for turning enslaved people on uh, their masters. And as for the Somerset decision, the Somerset decision was a decision that if you took an enslaved person the important thing to remember during the Revolutionary Era is that England, slavery was illegal in England. England had never allowed slavery since Roman times. When Rome fell and England became a Christian country back in 800 or whenever it was, slavery was abolished and was never allowed. And if anybody brought an enslaved person to England, they would immediately become free. The air of England is too, brief, too pure for an enslaved person to and so when a, when a wealthy person, people were growing well, very wealthy in the Bahamas, and in, uh, well, in um, Barbados, and in Jamaica, and in South Carolina, and in Virginia, and many of those wealthy plantation owners 
would go or send their children to England to, with their enslaved valets or house servants, they would be immediately free. And the Somerset decision simply reconfirmed that when the head of taxation for all of the colonies of Virginia fled because of the opposition to the Stamp Act, he goes back to England and his Somerset, his enslaved valet, is immediately free. Um, and that is used by Americans to say, well, we're certainly treated as second colonists, we're certainly treated as second class people. They, they let us, they're perfectly willing to let us pass laws to allow enslavement because they'll make money on it. But if we try to bring our enslaved people, well, they'll look down on us. And so that helped the feeling of disconsent. There was a whole other factor of the revolution that we, America, that Jefferson had and Washington had and Franklin had and Adams had, that we're, we're equal to these British and we're being treated as second-class citizens. And they were. So I think both of those did have an effect, but it was not necessarily the type of effect that one would expect. It was sort of a, 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 a complex effect that sort of played through the situation. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, you hear a lot today about systemic racism and, you know, racism basically embedded into this country in like, for example, the prison system and other things. Do you feel like slavery or systemic racism is still a part of America or it's something more akin to isolated incidents? Well, I think I made probably pretty clear the, my feeling about that. My, my sense is that, is that is, is Jim Wallace of Sojourners has written about racism being America's original sin, the slavery. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that it's, it's so central to American life, and it's, it's hard, it's difficult to escape it because many of us who think we've escaped it haven't, even though it's the air we breathe. Does that make any sense? It's 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 around us. It's with us. We we and yet we assume we're free of it, and it, it's it's difficult sometimes to make progress when you're not even aware that it, it's so much a part of you. And you know that that's not that's not meant as a condemnation. It's simply meant as a, a recognition of something that we really need to work with in this country, and especially places like this, Pepperdine, where I teach. The Christian schools need to really come to terms with the extent to which racism continues in ways that we don't even recognize, and often don't even want to recognize. Does that help? If I can add something that I think has helped my students. We don't need to go back to slavery. We, we can just go back to redlining. And I can see how my family greatly benefited from serving in the military and getting hope to buy a mortgage. And other, family, other people of just my grandparents and my parents' generation were denied that. So it's, it's, it's really recent history, and we've never fully reckoned with it or corrected that. And that alone has led to knock-on effects. And so I would say it is still systemic and still something that um, we need to work on, but we can also recognize where there's been progress. No one else wants to touch well, that. I would like to say, too, uh, that I really, really appreciate what Chris said. Uh, and it made me think, I wish I had said some of the things Chris said. <laughs> because... The, the fact of the matter is, it was slavery and liberty, and both of those were playing off against each other, and that's really, really important. Having said all that, the, the racist dimension is still with us. 
Professor Larson has graciously agreed to stay and sign books. For those of you that would like to purchase one of his books, thank you to the bookstore for showing up and uh, providing that opportunity. Um, also, uh, thank you to the library for providing the refreshments over here. Those of you that will be attending the dinner, remember it's on the third floor of the Thornton Administrative Center. And finally, let's really thank uh, Professor Larson and the panel. Have a good evening. You're dismissed.